Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. There's a, a bunch of new people that have joined us recently. So welcome to you guys. Thank you for enjoying the recent videos. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Dr. Rob Fleming. Uh, hi, Rob. Good evening. And Rob is going to be talking to us about SAS doctors or uh, specialty grade and associate specialist is that I, I will I will fill in the gaps for you in a minute certainly I'm yeah. sure <laughs> so the reason why this video is important and the reason why I'm really happy that Rob has agreed to come and speak to us all today is we are very blindsided often from an early stage in our medical education even for some of us before we go to medical school into learning about the typical typical as in most well-trodden path perhaps of you go to medical school you become a medical student and then you become a foundation doctor then you become a registrar and then you become a consultant and you work until you retire and that's what you do whereas clearly for for huge huge numbers of doctors and a huge part of the workforce that's not actually the case and won't be the case for people perhaps like me or, or many people at my stage who may who may find another route that works better for them so rob i will invite you uh, if you were just to give us a bit of background about yourself and then we can jump in so um ollie yeah good evening thank you again for having me uh, i am um as you say i'm rob fleming i am and i am a specialty doctor so i am a SAS doctor, a specialty doctor being one of the types of SAS doctor that there are out there. And I'll talk about the rest in a few moments. Um, so my history is largely as you described. So I'm a UK medical graduate. I went to medical school in Liverpool, finished my training in Lancaster. Um, I was a foundation doctor in Lancaster. And then I got a national training number at ST1 level, because that's what we did then. Um, and I was the MMC year. So I entered into run through training in 2007 with every expectation that I would be spat out the other end as a consultant. Um, and as happens to an awful lot of people, my career did not run entirely in the manner in which I might have expected when I was becoming a foundation doctor. Um, so I started my, uh, I started my ST1 in Manchester and then I, progressed I took an intergenerary transfer for personal reasons to the East Midlands and I got my way through to ST4 level by which point I had met my now wife um, and we had thought about starting a family and as an awful lot of people encounter I was at an age in my kind of late 20s where I wanted to buy a house have a family progress the non-medical parts of my life um, in a way that training really wasn't allowing me to do. Um, and I'd say fair play to anyone who manages to, to get married and have children while working as a trainee in our current healthcare system, because I sure as hell couldn't do it. Um, so I, I decided and took a, took a very conscious choice to take a sideward step um, and become a specialty doctor. Um, and part of the reason why I felt empowered to do that is the same reason why I tweet and why I talk and why I try and make myself as visible in the world as I can and um, it's because I saw other people who had done so and it seemed to see their circumstances better um, so I resigned my training number um, and I became a specialty doctor in 2012 um, and I've now spent 10 years working as a specialty doctor in aesthetist. Um, I saw inspirational people who were doing that role, doing what they wanted to within a career in medicine and without having to jump through the hoops and the machinations and the constant rotation of being trainees. Um, and they seemed to be happier than I was. Um, and so I decided I liked the idea of being one of them rather than carrying on as a trainee. Um, right, you're wrongly. Um, and uh, and I think, I think, as you say, it's important to talk about these things because an awful lot of the time we don't really discuss people's career options. There is a an expectation of doing what's normal or conventional um we wouldn't allow our trainees to make decisions without a full amount of information around the decision that they're making but we do it to our colleagues all the time um and so you know i i write a lot and tweet a lot and give interviews and presentations like this one in the hope that i can raise a little bit of awareness so that people can make the career decision that suits them amazing well there, there's so much to unpack and, and i think all of it like, like you say it's a really nice analogy about giving people information um because with more data we can make better decisions about 
about everything and as you say it seems very peculiar that we don't really do that for careers which are arguably one of the most central parts of our of our of our lives especially as doctors and that's actually the place where i want to start with the professional identity aspect of all of this because your pathway well i'm i'm going to start with with something a bit more broad your pathway you said that you you embarked on a on a typical specialty training journey as as was typical for the time in anesthetics and you have then gone through all the rigmarole of getting a training number and doing the specialty you want to do and developing as a as a doctor and and doing all of that so to become a SAS doctor, or you said that you were a specialty doctor, and that is only one of the subtypes of SAS that exist. How much experience does one need? Obviously, you're an anaesthetist, but say I was going to be a, I don't know, a cardiologist or a, a gastroenterologist. Is it is it the same pathway? Yes, no. So it is. So there are the contracts have changed um, a number of times. Even the course over the course of my career, the contracts have changed several times. So the current SAS contracts that are available are the specialty doctor contract, which is what I am, which is what the majority of SAS doctors are. Um, in order to become a specialty doctor, you don't need a great deal, really. You need to have a license to practice in the UK. So you need to be on the medical register. Um, you need to have four years postgraduate experience, uh, two of which are in your parent specialty. Um, it says in the, the eligibility says two years in a training program, but actually equivalent, equivalent experience is counted. So you need four years as a doctor two within your specialty or a relevant specialty. So anyone who is kind of completing CT2 or CT3 in a, in a training program um, has absolutely got the required experience to become a specialty doctor if they wanted to be. Um, an awful lot of doctors will enter the UK from abroad and again, these doctors will often enter in as locally employed doctors or as specialty doctors. Um, and again, the, 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 there are a number of doctors with a, a lot more experience than that working as specialty doctors, including myself, but that is the minimum requirement. And, and it should be normal to see people taking career breaks if they want to and having a spell working as a specialty doctor before perhaps then entering into higher training. So, so you said that we were talking about postgraduate experience, right? So, just again for the for the unfamiliar what what all doctors in the uk not only will do but have to do is we have to go through medical school and to work in a specialty you have to complete the foundation program that is f1 and f2 so your first two years and then that's broadly when people will start to make the decision about what they are or aren't going to do if you want to be a physician, a surgeon, a GP, a, a radiologist, or whatever you want to do. Um, and most people will enter training. As you say, they might go into core surgical training or, or now internal medicine training for one or two years. If, for example, I decided that I didn't want to go into IMT, for example, and I were to perhaps work as a teaching fellow in, uh, I, I don't know, in uh, anesthetics or something say for your specialty or I was going to locum somehow in in A&E for example is that the same or would I need more structured experience than that so I'm assuming we're talking say straight out of the foundation program if yeah. you were to go straight from yeah no so I think the majority of people will find it easier is perhaps not the right word but certainly more convenient to gain a couple more years experience in a formal core training program or imt training program and what i would say is though that actually the eligibility is incredibly open-ended so if you want to become a specialty doctor you could conceivably do the foundation program and then two years in surgical specialties in locally employed trust doctor clinical fellow type posts and then you would meet the eligibility to apply for a specialty doctor job. And again, you know, specialty doctor jobs that are advertised are often advertised with a specific service gap in mind. So it may be that what you have achieved in your two years isn't necessarily what is then described within the role that is being advertised. But again, employers can't be too fussy when they advertise specialty doctor posts, because again, it is supposed to be open to doctors who've only done four years postgraduate experience too in their specialty. So they can't expect you then to necessarily work, you know, on a senior registrar rotor with that level of experience, advertising those kinds of jobs would be 
would considerably reduce the number of applicants they would get. I see. So it's, well, it, to some degree, it seems to me, and this is someone who doesn't know much about the topic, but it seems to put the ball in your court a little bit more perhaps than you, you know even as an i'm an f2 doctor now for those watching i'm i feel kind of extremely at the mercy of whatever my program tells me i have to do right and that will be the same for the next stage of things when i apply possibly for a specialty training program but it sounds from what from what you're saying, if I'm understanding correctly, that once you've once you've done enough of that to get the requisite experience that you need to be a, a competent and safe independent doctor in that specialty, that actually it gives you a bit more control over how your life develops. Yeah, no, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and what I would say is you've used the word kind of competent and independent there. Now, we would only expect someone entering into a specialty doctor role to have the kind of equivalent level of ability of someone with the same experience in a training program. So you wouldn't expect someone in the first year of a specialty doctor post to be working independently any more than you would expect the typical ST3, CT3 to be working independently. So you would expect people to work at the level of their ability and then potentially progress towards greater independence while working as a specialty doctor. And um, you're absolutely correct, though, that actually, you know, you are somewhat hitting the nail on the head that one of the attractive aspects of taking what I call in the talks that I give an alternative career pathway is that it potentially gives you more choice. So, you know, if you were to take uh, an F3 year and then have a one year kind of clinical teaching fellow type job in surgery and then have a one-year trust doctor type job in surgery you would more than meet the eligibility to, required to become a specialty doctor in a surgical specialty and then while working as a specialty doctor it should then be normal if you follow the contracts and you follow the national documents it should be normal to then become increasingly independent and increasingly experienced and either broaden or narrow your clinical niche in the areas that interest you and suits your employer um, and target yourself towards a future senior role without entering a training program at all. It should be possible to do that. Um, and again, that's well described by a lot of national documents. Now, there are a lot of documents talking about in the way that I do, NHS employers describe SAS careers as being an attractive additional pathway for a career in medicine. This shouldn't be seen as something that's unusual. This should be something that people are choosing to do, but it remains the, the, un, the undiscussed path. One of the big things, and this was the first question that I was going to ask at the very beginning before I before I sidetracked myself, and increasingly because of all the stuff that's going on about pay at the moment, people, I think most of us, and increasingly perhaps the public, have this view of doctors that we are, you know, very overworked and underpaid at the beginning of our careers, but then as we ascend the career ladder if you like that eventually we'll be earning mega bucks and and doing all of this and certainly a sense of progression with time in is i think something that people tie to what a doctor is and what a doctor does could you tell us a bit about let's say that as you've described i'm i'm a newly minted specialty doctor in in a surgical specialty let's say but as time goes by i'm going to want that independence increased pay you know all the things that people want so what scope is there for for career progression as a SAS doctor so well if you become a specialty doctor and you stay a specialty doctor for your entire career and um, you will see incremental pay increases over the course of your career and um, there is an expectation that everyone will see those increments and that they will progress naturally through the pay scale and through the pay points um, and there is only now one pay threshold that you really have to demonstrate something for um, while working as a specialty doctor. So the higher pay threshold in the specialty doctor pay scale requires that you have progressed from working with more direct supervision to more indirect supervision and that you've picked up an additional non-clinical role. So there is an expectation that you have broadened your role beyond the clinical. Um, and that kicks in, I think, at around year six in the specialty doctor pay scale. Um, and then there are further increments on the other side of that higher pay threshold. Um, all told, the specialty doctor pay scale maxes out short of the first year consultant pay scale. So a specialty doctor will never earn as much as a consultant, um, but it's not to be sniffed at. And that career progression and that pay progression is something that you do get 
if you are a specialty doctor. Um, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the kind of difference between specialty doctors and trust doctors, clinical fellow type posts, the things that the other types of roles that you've mentioned. So the specialty doctor pay scale and the specialty doctor contract are nationally set. So they are a nationally negotiated contract with nationally negotiated terms and conditions of service and the nationally negotiated pay scale. And um, if you are working as a trust doctor or a locally employed doctor or a clinical fellow um, or an F3, um, all of these roles are trust derived contracts and therefore trusts can largely do what they want in terms of the terms and conditions of service and to a certain extent, the pay. So a lot of um, uh, locally employed trust doctor type roles are based on some version of the trainee pay scale, but there is no necessary, there isn't necessarily a guarantee of pay progression with those roles. So there are some long-term trust doctors out there um, who in my opinion would be far better suited and far better catered for if they were on a specialty doctor contract. Um, but we do seem as a specialty to have accepted that we won't always necessarily offer the national contract and pay scale for the work. And again, that feeds into something we've discussed already is that because we don't talk enough about alternative careers and what's supposed to happen if you are outside of a formal training programme, things that aren't supposed to happen end up occasionally kicking in, which is the other reason why I give talks and write so much is I like to empower people with knowledge and um, so that they aren't being exploited by the nature of the fact that they aren't in a formal training program. Yeah, that, and that's really important. I've already mentioned in passing all of the political stuff that's going on with, with the BMA and with um, potential union action and things at the moment. And again, for those who maybe haven't, haven't gone to medical school yet, or you are partway through medical school and, and thinking about becoming a doctor or applying for a specialty, there is, I think we underestimate the value that comes from, like you say, having a nationally set contract that is much less malleable um, from a trust point of view, because we've got to remember that what an NHS trust ultimately wants is to do as much as possible for as little money as possible. And if you are, as Rob describes, one of an F3 doctor or a junior clinical fellow or one of these more transient perhaps type roles, especially in a desirable specialty where they know that you kind of have to be there for the specialty experience, you can very easily be used as a cog in in making that happen rather than the post isn't working for you, you are a you're a piece of a larger plan yeah. um you know and I, I feel this is someone wanting to do neurosurgery i know that huge numbers of these trust grade temporary posts exist because people are desperate for the experience and trusts know that and and will will use that to their advantage but that's perhaps a a conversation for, <laughs> for another time um what i was going to ask next rob is You've obviously mentioned that you're from an anaesthetics background, but uh, are there, is it possible that you could be a specialty doctor or a SAS doctor of another subtype in, in all specialties? Do some specialties have more than others? Do some not have specialty SAS doctors? Um, so I guess I guess the only the only specialty that really doesn't have SAS doctors because there's no equivalent is primary care. So, um, you know, I think a, a salaried GP is still on the GP register, is still recognised as a GP. Um, so while in primary care, you will have GP partners and you will have salary GPs working within the practice. That's probably the closest analogy within primary care. But and it's a big difference that salary GPs are still on the GP register, whereas the majority of SAS and locally employed doctors such as myself are not on the specialist register for our specialty. So while I may be a senior experienced and independent SAS anaesthetist, I am not on the specialist register for anaesthesia. So I cannot apply for a consultant job in anaesthesia. Um, what I would say is that, you know, know that within surgery, within medicine, anaesthesia, ED, you know, I don't imagine there is a single specialty in the UK that doesn't have a SAS doctor or two within their number and um, certainly among the acute specialties it may be more common so um, an awful lot of SAS doctors have a an ongoing resident on call component as part of their job for a large part of their career so an awful lot of SAS anaesthetists for example will be 
perhaps functioning very independently during the day, but maybe functioning on a, a registrar type rotor out of hours. Um, so again, one of the ways in which um, trusts will fill large numbers of rotor slots will be to have specialty doctors who are working as the registrar out of hours. Um, so we are very common in anesthesia, we're very common in ED. Um, there are some in surgery, there are some in, are some in medicine. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to approach this from the point of view of a, it, it's kind of if we now have, as a result of this talk or as a result of the talks you give, which I'm, which I'm sure happens, that we now have a, 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 a group of medical students or doctors who are now thinking, this sounds great. I'm going to be a specialty doctor. Um, I think it, I, I'm just trying to make sure that we explore we explore all the elements properly that someone someone would need in order to know that that they can still do you know they can still do what they want, which is be a medic, a surgeon, a, an anaesthetist, um, and not uh, not fall into any pitfalls when trying to navigate that. And I'm I'm sure there are many, but one of the things you just touched on there, and th this might be a contentious topic, but equally that probably means that we should discuss it. Um, what's going to be intuitively true is that someone who, as you say, becomes more and more independent and more and more skilled and has more and more experiential learning, despite perhaps not being in a formal training program, um, practically is eventually going to approach parity with a consultant, right, in terms of their experience and, and knowledge base and all the rest of it. Now, what's that dynamic like and how how do people try to navigate it or or not navigate it as the case may be um well there are a few things there are a few things to kind of um touch upon or unpick there a little bit so firstly we have we've so far only talked about one half of the sas contracts that are available and as of last year there is a senior sas contract for people who are working in the manner in which you just described so the the Prior to 2008, there was a, a contract called the Associate Specialist, and the Associate Specialist was it was the senior SAS role. And unfortunately, the last contract negotiation in 2008, 2009 time closed the senior role. So we've had a decade where there was no senior contract to progress to. So my generation of specialty doctors knew or anticipated that we would be specialty doctors forever. We weren't necessarily pleased about it because we, many of us work alongside existing associate specialists who were created before 2008 and many of us are doing the same work. Um, so recognising that this was a problem, NHS employers and the Department of Health and, uh, and the BMA and various other negotiators created a senior contract last year. So there is now a senior SAS contract, which is called the specialist, which replaces the old closed associate specialist role. So I would hope, I would hope that going forward, when doctors reach that point where they are working independently, where there is a degree of parity in their ability, experience and, and autonomy, um, that they will naturally progress towards being SAS specialists so that we will have, as we described, that kind of alternative career pathway. The alternative career pathway now has a destination, so there is a senior role to progress to. Um, some doctors will find that as they progress and they become more experienced and independent, um, they wish to become consultants. And again, as we described, a lot of SAS doctors may have become specialty doctors because they've entered into the UK from abroad. And um, so a lot of this cohort may then seek to get on the specialist register either by entering training um, or by undertaking what's called CESR, which is the Certificate for Equivalence of Specialist Registration, if memory serves, um, which is an alternative route to get on the specialist register. So achieving CESR requires gathering an, a, an extraordinary amount of evidence so we're talking telephone directories worth of evidence more than a thousand pages for the typical application and um, but again essentially requires generating generating that word was uh, generating the um the same evidence that you would do so in higher and advanced training only doing so outside of a training program um it's an extraordinary amount of work but if you can achieve it and submit it and the equivalence committees agree that what you've submitted demonstrates your equivalence then you can become a consultant without entering into a formal training program again and um, potentially without ever having been part of a formal training program in the uk um, so those are two routes by which all that experience and independence could be recognized and um, obviously becoming a consultant will mean having a consultant salary becoming a specialist also carries largely the same salary now as a consultant does so progressing to being a SAS specialist means having 
parity in pay as well as parity in ability and independence. Um, but that said, an awful lot of specialty doctors are very happy to remain specialty doctors. An awful lot of people find that as part of a portfolio career, having a having a clinical role that is perhaps solely clinical or less non-clinical than consultant colleagues in the same department allows them to do other things within their lives. It gives them choice um, and it allows them to balance their work work and against their life in a way that perhaps formal training and being a consultant doesn't So an awful lot of specialty doctors may very well be happy remaining specialty doctors the really nice thing that i think we've captured there is that it's it's all about choice and we've all we've not kind of got two two pathways running separately that will never intertwine and unless you go into specialty training at st1 or whatever straight out of the foundation program that you can that you can never have a consultant job at the end or equally if you get too far into your SAS career and then you you think oh no I should have I should go back and 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 go from the beginning there's actually it's much more of a fluid continuum that exists between the two rather than discrete pathways um and similar analogy I guess to the academic medical track that we see that actually you you don't have to live just as an academic you can be an academic and a doctor or you can be a lecturer or you can work part-time or there's it, it's about making the job and your life work for you and actually it sounds that for many people that that's the main takeaway that i'm getting from this that medicine is well known for being an extremely restrictive and lifestyle dominating career but actually there's more options than we think. It's just that we don't know about them. Yeah, we, we don't talk about them. And, and the reason we don't talk about them is largely just down to medical culture. We behave as if there is only one acceptable route. Um, and one of, the, one of the other real big reasons why I do what I do in the wider world and why I'm so keen to talk about these things is because again, I think we lose colleagues every year because we don't talk about choice. Yeah. We don't talk about career choices. You know, people who have got an aptitude and an affinity to anesthesia or cardiology or neurosurgery may find that at the point in their lives where they need to engage with the training program, they can't, or where they need to get a training number, they can't, or they may have difficulty with an exam. And that doesn't mean that their career in that specialty is over unless they want it to be. But we don't talk about it. And because we don't talk about it, people with an aspiration and an affinity towards a certain specialty may then choose in an, and end up in another specialty. And I, I think, you know, the bigger picture workforce ramifications of all of this are not to be underestimated. We are currently in a workforce crisis and we are losing colleagues from specialties they're good at because we don't talk about their career choices. And that is bonkers to me. That's, you know, that, that, that strikes me as absolutely preposterous. But the reason why we do that is, again, the kind of culture and expectations associated with a SAS role. People have preconceptions. If they know about it at all, they have preconceptions about it that aren't necessarily always positive. And I, I, I do what I do to try and challenge some of those. Um, speaking about, you know, the linking up of the pathways, this isn't something I think that we do very well within medicine at the moment. Um, it is challenging to see ESR and it is challenging to re-enter training if you find yourself out of training for a very long period of time. You do make a choice at some point in your career to become a SAS doctor and then you will probably, having done so, um, if you want to end up on the specialist register, CESR becomes the route of choice because it's very difficult to then get back into a training program. Um, you know, the, the perfect the perfect person to slot into the next stage of training is someone who's just exited the stage before. So again, I think we could do as a profession, I think we could do this better. And I think large national bodies could make it much easier for people to slot back into training at an appropriate level to allow them to finish without having to do CESL. But that's somewhat pie in the sky at the moment. That's not, that's not within my gift fix. Um, well, who knows if I make enough noise, perhaps someone who's gifted is within can do so. Um, but the other thing is, uh, you know, all roads potentially lead to being a future senior doctor. You may just not be on the specialist register. You may not be a consultant, but there are SAS doctors working as consultants in all aspects of their work, both clinical and non-clinical. There are associate specialists who are pre-2008 and specialists being created now who are expected to work as consultants in all aspects of their work, despite not being consultants. So, again, there is a route to the same goal, or the same end. Um, and a comparable pay structure that doesn't require CESR or going back into training and actually becoming a consultant. Um, the other thing is an awful lot of SAS doctors choose to broaden their horizons in a way that, 
you know, they can narrow down their non-clinical interests in a way that perhaps being a trainee doesn't allow them to do and being a consultant, an early career consultant doesn't allow them to do either. So there are, you know, there are SAS doctors out there with interest in being noisy and being advocates. That, that's me and people like me. Um, there are SAS doctors out there with an interest in education. So um, Jamie Reed, who's one of the other national representatives, Jamie Reed's the SAS lead at the Royal College of Physicians. He is the incoming dean of medical education at Cardiff Medical School, and he's a specialty doctor. So the, the next few years of graduates from Cardiff Medical School will be graduating from a medical school where the dean of their medical school was a SAS doctor. And that is the nature of being a SAS doctor is that it shouldn't limit you in terms of where your career takes you, um, provided you don't let it and provided the culture of being a SAS doctor doesn't put barriers in your way that shouldn't be there. Well, what a way to round off. Um, the only reason I'm saying that is that Zoom is is barking <laughs> at me angry. I really need to invest in a professional license. But thank you so much, Rob, for coming on. Uh, we've got we've got four minutes on the clock. Um, I would just ask, do you have any last minute or one last sort of golden takeaway that you would like people watching this video to, to take home with them? Just, just to reiterate some of the things that we've talked about already, that careers should be about choice and choice is about knowledge. So unless you know what your career options are, you aren't making an informed choice for your career. Um, and the other thing I would say is that an awful lot of people will find themselves in a SAS career and that we are an enormous and supportive community. There are a vast number of SAS doctors out there. Um, it is easy to find yourself feeling a bit alone if your career takes you somewhere you didn't expect it to when you graduate from medical school and expect to follow the same preordained path as everyone else. But to know that you are not alone um, and that there are a large number of SAS representatives out there who are doing everything within our power to make this career everything that it should be. And where can people go to, uh, if perhaps if they've been inspired by this talk or I'll say one of your talks, where can they go to to learn a bit more? Where's the best place to start? So um, I would say following me on Twitter is probably a good start. <laughs> um, uh, there is also a talk that I've put on Twitter, on, on uh, YouTube, which I don't know if you want to link to. Or yeah, we'll link there. that. Yeah. Um, and I would say there's a lot of national documents out there. The Academy of Medical Royal College's SAS committee produce an awful lot of national documents. But again, I'm not necessarily sure that they're targeted to your audience. There are some things in there that would allow them to have a read and find more out. So one of the documents, SAS, A Viable Career Choice, which was released last year, I think, um, is quite nice and talks about, again, the options and the, the career choices that you have if you work as a SAS doctor. Um, and, you know, if you have a specialty in mind that you're interested in, you will inevitably find that that specialty is Royal College or the association thereof um, have uh, have a SAS committee and inevitably will have a web page. So I'm, I'm um, the current... For, for not much longer, but I'm the current chair of the SAS committee, an organisation called the Association of Anaesthetists. Um, so we have a we have a, a page full of information, um, as does the Royal College of Anaesthetists, um, and as does I think most most of the Royal Colleges will have some SAS pages on there to, to to get more information about your specific specialty choice. Perfect. Well, Dr. Rob Fleming, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Right. Well, thank you. We'll leave all of the links to uh, to everything that Rob's just discussed at the end there in in the description below. Some of those documents, uh, Rob's Twitter will be on screen below where his his video is, and uh, that talk again that he's referenced will be linked. Dr. Rob Fleming, thank you very much.